Welcome everybody to the Rowan College at Burlington County uh, Global Studies Lecture Series. This is a continuation of a series of conversations that started in fall 2020 in global health environment and security and key international issues affecting those. This is partially sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education's Undergraduate International Studies and Foreign Language Grant Program, uh, which is a multi-year grant uh, that we have here at the college along with our partner institution, Rowan University, to build global and international studies uh, designations and courses in high demand languages such as Arabic and Chinese, and also to uh, create and uh, uh, do student activities, including the Global Studies Lecture Series reflecting these initiatives. This, uh, this event is also hosted by Rowan College, uh, a mid-sized two and three-year college in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, serving the largest county in the state with anywhere from five to 7,000 students each semester. Our college has one of the most ethnically diverse student bodies in the state and region, uh, with one of the lowest tuition costs as well. We offer a diverse array of degree and certificate programs across numerous academic and workforce focused disciplines. Many students stay for a third year in our innovative three plus one programs, whereby students can earn a four year degree at a highly reduced cost. And this is also an appropriate host institution for such a series on international issues, as Rowan College has one of the most diverse student bodies based on major demographic characteristics of students, such as ethnic background and country of origin of student. I'm your host for this event. Uh, I'm Brandon Chapman, uh, Department Chair of Anthropology and Sociology at the college. And the goal of this lecture series is to bring to our campus and here our virtual WebEx campus, top level scholars, academics, researchers, and industry professionals at all levels of career, early, mid, and late career, that are experienced knowledgeable experts in global health, environment, and security issues, and to develop this knowledge and skill set in our students at both Rowan University and Rowan College, and to have a dynamic conversation about key global issues in these areas, and to give students such avenues to advance their training in these topics too. Look for more of these events in the future. Uh, we had just a few weeks ago, Hal Brands uh, from uh, John Hopkins and AEI. Uh, we were talking about uh, the uh, emerging, possibly new uh, international order that we are in uh, since the uh, start of the Russia-Ukraine war. We also talked about the effects and uh, strategies and grand strategies around the Russia-Ukraine war, both from the West and from uh, Russia's perspective. And in two weeks uh, from today, on April 28th, we will have uh, Leon Aaron uh, from the American Enterprise Institute. He is a Russian national. He immigrated to the United States in uh, the late 70s, and he is a longtime uh, scholar of Russian politics. He will be talking about, it's also timely in the news, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war as well. So we have a theme that is going along with the uh, you know, major current events uh, in the world uh, uh, you know, the past, uh, past couple months. And so he'll be talking about uh, Vladimir Putin's strategies and the uh, future of Russia and Ukraine uh, during and after uh, this, uh, this war. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Norman M. Neymark, Robert and Florence McDonald Professor of East European Studies at Stanford University, and also a longtime senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, also at Stanford. Uh, he has held numerous positions during his long and distinguished career at Stanford, including serving as the director of Stanford's Center for Russian and East European Studies. He's been chair of its history department, and uh, he served as director of Stanford's inter interdisciplinary programs in international relations and international policy studies. Uh, he serves on the editorial boards of several major academic journals, including the American Historical Review, the Journal of Modern European History, and East European Politics and Societies. And he's written uh, a slew of excellent books on uh, genocide and war, uh, ethnic cleansing as well, over uh, the past few decades. Uh, some of his most recent works uh, what will likely be much of the topic this evening, uh, Genocide of World History, uh, published just a few years ago, a uh, history of historical examples of genocide and uh, the definitions of that term. He's also written a couple of recent books on uh, going along with his ex, uh, expertise in the Soviet Union, uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, Stalin and the Fate of Europe, published a few years ago, and also Stalin's Genocides, looking at the uh, genocides and famines uh, under the Stalin regime during the Soviet period. And he's also, uh, from a couple of decades back, I believe he's also uh, authored a book called Fires of Hatred, uh, which looks at ethnic cleansing uh, as, a, um, uh, as a result of uh, religious conflict and racism. So uh, just a note on format uh, for this uh, afternoon and this evening. Uh, Norman is going to, I believe, uh, speak for a few minutes uh, on some definitions of genocide uh, and sort of setting the stage uh, for our discussion. And then uh, we can have uh, audience questions, of course, uh, with video and audio, as Norman has suggested. 
And uh, I also have prepared some questions as well, uh, if we need to, uh, to be able to extend the discussion uh, towards our time and hopefully be able to learn more about uh, distinguishing genocide and war, some historical examples of this, and perhaps we will be able to uh, even uh, discuss current events in uh, Bucha and uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation and all of that. So with that, and his talk titled, Is There a World History of Genocide? Uh, let's welcome Norman Neymar to Rowan College. So Norman, uh, you can go ahead and thank you for being here this uh, this afternoon and this evening. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Brandon, for the uh, invitation. It's nice to be with you all. <clears throat> I'm actually not going to do the kind of is there a world history of genocide because that would take me in directions uh, that, um, you know, would take up an hour in a different different way. So what I am going to do is try to spend the first uh, kind of 15, 20 minutes here with you uh, talking about definitions of genocide uh, and then move to Ukraine and talk about um, the very interesting and difficult uh, question of whether genocide is going on now or whether it's something that we may be seeing in the, in the near future. So, which is many people are worried about. So that's uh, that's the plan, and uh, I'll watch my time because the, the temptation for me is always to go longer than I need to. So I will cut myself off. So I want to talk first of all a little bit about the uh, <clears throat> the definition of genocide um, because it's important. I mean, on one level, I have to say, with the Ukrainian business, I was just talking to a friend of mine about this. You know, is it genocide? What's going on there now? Is it not genocide? You know, on one hand, you know, these kinds of questions are not very useful. I mean, it's a terrible set of atrocities that have taken place. Do we really want to get into an argument? Is it genocide? Is it not genocide? You know, President Biden called it genocide. The, um, the Ukrainians are calling it genocide. You know, some others might say it's not genocide. It's not a kind of question that's important. What's important is how do we deal with these awful atrocities and how do we stop them um, and how do we end that war. So that's one side of the problem. The other side of the problem, of course, is that you, when you use terms like genocide, you need to use them appropriately. You know, they have to have real meaning. Um, there's a tendency, not just in, in this war, I'm not even talking about this war, but all over for everyone to claim their genocide. And so you, you get involved in a kind of... Um, uh, you know, definitional process that is uh, complicated, but it's got to be, you know, it's got to be accurate. It's got to be accurate in part because genocide is the kind of word that has historical meaning, but it also has judicial meaning. It has a meaning for putting people on trial and putting them in jail. And so that meaning, you know, has to be as precise as we can make it. So that's the background to sort of talking about the definition and why it's important uh, to think about uh, the definition. So the story of definition begins with a, a, a man, a Polish Jew named Raphael Lemkin, who made his way to uh, the United States during the Second World War um, and had come to the realization already early in his career, in the 20s and 30s, while he was still in Poland, that um, something was going on in the world, you know, the mass murder, essentially, of, of peoples um, that should be proscribed by international law and wasn't. Um, and there was no real word for it. People talked about catastrophe. People talked about awful things happening. People talk about extreme violence. Uh, Churchill at one point says there's a crime that's going on out there. This was during the Second World War for which we have no name. And Lemkin gave it a name. And that name came in 1944 in one of his books, uh, The Axis Occupation of Europe in which he defined genocide, you know, roughly in the way that we use it today in the intentional, you know, destruction of peoples. Um, and Lemkin then became convinced of his, um, his uh, definition. He convinced other people of it. He was a, a real lobbyist for introducing a law of this sort. Uh, he went to Nuremberg in 1946 during the famous Nuremberg tribunals and got them to at least think about genocide. It wasn't the main thing at Nuremberg. The main thing at Nuremberg was war of aggression. That's what the Nazis were tried for. That's what they were hanged for. Uh, but Lemkin kept working on it and together with others um, uh, who, who felt he was on the right track, was able to influence the UN enough to get them to introduce a convention on the 
Prevention and Punishment of Genocide in December 1948. And that convention, you know, set out the basic definition of genocide that we use today, uh, that scholars use, that uh, lawyers use in international courts. And that definition basically says, maybe I'll just read it to you to make it, make it easier. In the present convention, genocide means all or means, I'm sorry, any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy. Again, intent is very important. In whole or in part, that means you don't need to destroy every, everyone. A national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, comma, as such. End of quote. Now, there are no, um, you know, <clears throat> there are reasons that this definition is insufficient. One of the reasons, in my view, is it doesn't include social and political groups. It just talks about ethnic, racial, religious, and national groups. But what's important about the definition is that groups are destroyed, ethnic, national, racial, whatever, even if you include political and social groups, which I do in my work, they're destroyed as a group, as you know, with the ability to function as a group. So that's that important final comma as such period. Um, and that's an important piece of how we think about genocide. It's not just, not just, I mean, there are things, massacres, right, of people. Uh, and massacres, you know, can be intended just to kill a bunch of people. Um, uh, or it can be intended as retribution. Uh, it can be intended in lots of different ways. But you need to intend to destroy a group as such. That's, that's the core of that definition. Now, that definition, you know, has been uh, built upon over the years. I mean, like any legal any law, any set of legal precedents, you know, precedents grow over time. And so especially in the 1990s with the courts in um, you know, about the Bosnian um, uh, genocide at Srebrenica, about Rwanda, um, uh, about other cases of genocide, you know, the courts have expanded the definition and expanded upon the definition and, and made it more complex uh, but fundamentally, it remains the same. But let me give you an example. For example, in the, in the Rwandan case, <clears throat> the courts in Arusha, which was basically the special tribunal for Rwanda, um, uh, indicated that uh, systematic rape uh, was a part of genocide. Well, this wasn't talked about at all in the 1940s. I mean, people didn't talk about rape. Um, but the, the court then recognized that in genocide, you know, this kind of systematic rape of women could be part and is part of what genocide is. So that's an important, you know, addition, in other words, to our understanding of uh, genocide. Okay, let's, let's now turn to Ukraine, um, you know, where a series of atrocities, you know, have been uncovered, where every day, if you look at CNN, New atrocities are being discovered. Mass graves uh, have been discovered, um, you know, with people who have been tortured, you know, their arms tied behind their back, and uh, they've been tortured and eliminated. What does this mean in terms of these international crimes and in terms of genocide? Well, you know, the argument that genocide is being... Uh, 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 done or being being um, perpetrated by the Russians uh, in uh, Ukraine are backed up by a couple of a couple of sets of evidence. One is the one I've just talked to you about. Uh, and that is that there are lots of killings, random killings, um, torturous killings. There's even been some rape. Um, and, um, you know, there's been um, uh, really uh, nasty brutality c conducted against peoples. There have been forced deportations. Children have been accused of being taken away from uh, from Mariupol and sent to Russia for re-education. I mean, there are all kinds of pieces of evidence that are being uh, uh, accumulated right now about the about the question of what kinds of crimes are going on. 
Okay, so what we need to do then is make sure we understand the different kinds of international crimes. And there are really four sets of them that come under the purview of the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court was set up in 1998 by the, by the Treaty of Rome, and then it began its functioning in 2002 in The Hague uh, in the Netherlands. And there are four sets of crimes that they deal with. You know, the idea was, by the way, not to have special tribunals as they had in Bosnia, as they had in Rwanda, as they had, you know, uh, in Sierra Leone and elsewhere. Uh, but the idea was to have a court that was there to deal with these international crimes. Okay, what are the crimes? All right, first of all, are war crimes. And war crimes are crimes that are committed during times of war, usually against civilians. It's clear to me, and I think clear to everyone, um, you know, that uh, the Russians are committing war crimes. Uh, President Biden called um, um, Putin a war criminal, and people got upset that he did. You know, my view is he's a war criminal. Why not call him a war criminal? But that, you know, people can differ on that. They say it's not diplomatic, but what's diplomatic, you know, about the situation in Ukraine right now? Not very much. Um, so he's a war criminal. And why is a war criminal? Because, for example, when you take artillery and you blow up, you know, an apartment block where people are living in there and there's no military purpose for that, that's a war crime. I mean, that's that kind of destruction of civilians is a war crime. Um, and so, you know, they're collecting evidence now on war crimes. Uh, by the way, under the rubric of w war crimes also comes massacres. Well, you might ask, what's the difference between a massacre and genocide? Well, I explained it to you in some senses. You know, you have to have the purpose of destroying the group as such. It just, just massacring, you know, 20 people or 25 people or 30 people, or even 100 people, if it's not meant to destroy the group as such, you know, it does not count uh, as, as a war crime. I mean, it counts as a war crime, but not as genocide. Okay, the second uh, group of crimes are crimes against humanity. And these often occur during war um, and, and usually have the form of, of torture or, um, uh, you know, uh, rape separate from the systematic rape uh, that, that is par a part uh, of genocide, uh, false imprisonment, uh, deportation of kids, you know, the kinds of stuff that, that uh, Russians are accused of doing in, um, in Mariupol. And it's pretty clear to me as well that, uh, uh, and not just to me, by the way, but also to, you know, observers who are there and to the Ukrainians who are keeping track of these crimes, I should have mentioned I went to a uh, I went to I attended a, a webinar this morning from Ukraine where the head of a, a human rights organization had said they recorded 650 different crimes, war crimes and crimes of hum against humanity in Ukraine, and it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, I think that that's uh, that's probably accurate. Okay, so those are two war crimes and crimes against humanity for which the Russians are clearly. Um, uh, liable. The third is a crime of aggression. And a crime of aggression, as I mentioned to you, was the crime that essentially Hitler and the Nazis committed uh, in the Second World War. They attacked Poland, they attacked Belgium, they attacked France, they attacked the Soviet Union without any cause, no cause, no, no reason. You know, you need some kind of reason for it not to be a war crime. It may be, if it's a border dispute, that does, I mean, um, War of aggression, a border dispute doesn't necessarily qualify as a war of aggression, that kind of thing. In other words, if it was just Donetsk, Donetsk and Luhansk, um, that wouldn't necessarily be a crime of aggression. But the, the attack uh, on Kiev and Kharkiv and to take over the whole country, that's a war of aggression. It was no, no prompting, no no provocation at all on the part of the uh, uh, Ukrainians. It's sh sheer war of aggression. The problem is, and I, and I need to make this brief, the, the International Criminal Court, when it became responsible for the wars of aggression, made a kind of deal, you know, with the people who had signed up for the court, um, that uh, state actions by states and actually non-state actors who were not subscribers to the International Criminal Court, and that includes, by the way, us, meaning the U.S., as well as Russia, 
um, cannot uh, be brought to court for war of aggression in front of the ICC. So the ICC, in other words, can deal with crimes against humanity. It can deal with um, it, it can deal with war crimes, but it can't deal with wars of aggression. This is something I've just you know tried to read the language on today or yesterday, and you know. It, 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 it twists your mind to read all that legalese, but that's the bottom line. Now, the fourth category, you know, some people would call it the crime of crimes, the worst of crimes. Other people don't agree. They say these four, four categories are more or less equal, is genocide. And here in Ukraine, you know, again, there's, there's evidence for it. There's the evidence of what's going on on the ground that Ukrainians are being killed. There's also a, an ideological backdrop that is frightening and scary when it comes to genocide. There are two parts to it. One is that Putin himself and some historical screeds has basically denied the existence of the Ukrainian people. He's denied the existence of the Ukrainian people as a separate people. They're just part of Russians. You know, they're just kind of Russians warmed over uh, and actually uh, deceived by um uh, a neo-Nazi elite, which is in the hands of the Americans uh, and uh, NATO and the Europeans. So he's denying the actual existence of Ukrainians as a separate nation. And that already gives, gives one the creeps that he's taking away that nationhood, right, uh, to which they aspire and indeed have, have accomplished. Um, the, the second piece of the story is there are some uh, documents that have come out. One uh, that came out about a week ago, maybe 10 days ago from Novosti, the official news service uh, of the Russian Federation. Uh, a man wrote an article. I mean, it's hard to tell whether it's an article, whether it's official, whether it's semi-official, which essentially says, no, it's not just the elite. You know that are neo-nazis ukrainians are neo-nazis and ukrainians who claim that they're independent and distinctive from russians are essentially nazis and have to be dealt with um, in terms of interning them uh, it doesn't say killing them but it does say you know putting them in camps and labor camps and re-educating them so uh, I, they don't say camps, by the way. They say putting them in forced labor. But, but essentially, you know, a, a kind of genocidal act of depriving Ukrainians of their national identity. So those kind of documents then lead one to worry a lot that if genocide is not being committed, that it will be committed. Um, and I think we have to watch very carefully uh, you know, in the next days and weeks, what happens with this new uh, chapter, as people have described it, of the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, one of the things this guy says is in quotes, let me, let me just read you a little bit. He talks about Ukro-Nazism. I've never heard that word before. Ukro-Nazism. In other words, Ukrainian Nazis. Ukraine is impossible as a nation state, the guy says. It says, a significant part of the masses of Ukrainians who are passive Nazis and accomplices of Nazism are also guilty and need to be re-educated. So you get some of the, the taste of this, what I would consider genocidal language. Okay, let me leave it at that. That was about 20 minutes, a little short of 20 minutes. So let's, um, I hope you have questions. If not, I threaten you with lecturing further. Thank you, Norman. Uh, well, yes, as we open up the questions here, uh, if, I think maybe an ordered way to do this would be to uh, raise your hands. Uh, you have, you should have what looks like a hand icon, uh, whether you're on your computer or your phone on the bottom of your screen that can raise your hand. You can, uh, so we can sort of Get in line if there are questions, and then uh, we can. Uh, you are invited to uh, come on video uh, and or audio, uh, whatever you are comfortable with to ask your question. If you are not comfortable with video and or audio, uh, you are also invited to uh, type your questions in the chat message board. There's a little what should look like a word uh, a speaking cloud. Uh, that's also a button on your the lower part of your screen uh, that can allow you to type in the chat message board. So. 
Uh, maybe as we wait for some potential questions, uh, Norman, if you don't mind, uh, maybe we can uh, just start off off of some of the themes. Um, uh, actually, I think we do have a, a hand raised here. Um, why don't we go with, uh, this is, uh, um, uh, and I want to get the pronunciation right, Adela. Uh, if it's not, uh, please correct me. Um, you can go ahead, uh, uh, Adela, whenever you're ready. This is Adela. Um, I just wanted to know what... Uh, what type of social or political group do you think is being affected in Ukraine with, um, I guess, in that far as the specific war crimes? I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Say that again, please. What if there's any social or political group in Ukraine that's being affected by the um, specific war crimes? Oh, I think it, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, and, and how do you pronounce your name, Adila? It's Adila. Adila, he was right. And I was wrong. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, it's directed the, the 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 war crimes are generally directed against the Ukrainian in quotes population. Now, within the Ukrainian population as a whole, and by this I mean not any specific social or national or political groups. It seems that one of the things that's happening is they're trying to find uh, Ukrainians uh, who are members of the nationalist parties, Ukrainians who are part of the, um, you know, their series of nationalist militias uh, that have been formed separately from the army, Ukrainian army, uh, that are targeted. There's a lot of discussion uh, about how they're stopping people uh, at checkpoints when they were trying to leave uh, Mariupol and checking men's bodies for tattoos, looking for tattoos. But even a kind of um, trident, which is the symbol of um, Ukraine. I mean, it's nothing more than a symbol of Ukraine. Uh, it would be like having an American flag on your shoulder, right? Um, are being taken out um, and disappear. Now, we don't know where they disappeared. We don't know where they've gone. We don't know if they've been killed or not, um, that sort of thing. So so the, the Russians are following this kind of um, uh, path. You know, it's a kind of self-fulfilling, what, what would you call it, a self-fulfilling lie in some ways, that they're Nazis. So they're looking for people, you know, who are carrying some kind of insignia uh, of, of a militant group or a nationalist group. I mean, even if they have, you know, Slava Ukraina, you know, glory to Ukraine on their shoulders. Excuse me, my life just went off. Uh, glory to Ukraine on their shoulders. You know, they would be they would be seized and interrogated and then presumably dealt with. Uh, there's this. Um, uh, people have been saying, and it seems likely, that of the many tens of thousands of evacuees uh, from Mariupol who have been evacuated to Russia, that they've been sent to so-called filtration camps. And those camps, you know, were quite widely known in the Soviet uh, times, where they would basically, you know, interrogate, you know, sometimes torture, um, people to get them to admit, you know, that they were nationalists or that they had fought with nationalist groups or that they were anti-Russian. And if they found that out, then these people would be in trouble. Uh, the other people then are sent and dispersed all over Russia to various labor camps and that kind of thing. But the people, you know, who say, you know, people who say, I'm Ukrainian, I'm going to fight for Ukraine, which is a lot of people. Right, and I believe in 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 Ukraine um, uh, um, are getting are getting in trouble. So so it's that kind of selectivity. Uh, it's a good question that uh, the Russians are applying. Even Russians by the way, are sometimes in that camp. I mean, we have a lot of you know Ukraine has we we don't know exactly, but roughly twenty twenty between twenty and twenty five percent Russian ethnicity. So Russians of Russian ethnicity are also seized by Russians. 
And if they're identified as having fought with Ukraine, as most are, they also were in trouble. So it's not just Ukrainians that they're, they're pulling out, but they're also pulling out Russians who identify with Ukraine. <clears throat> Let me leave it at that. Thank you, Thank you. Adela, for the question. Uh, Adela's uh, been an engaged and excellent student in multiple classes of mine, so it's uh, it's wonderful to hear uh, that question from her. And uh, that's that's why I got that's why I got the name right, Norman. So oh, okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I and uh, we've got a couple other questions here in a second. I just going off of your comments too. Um, I did see this uh, this writing. I forget the name as well. Uh, the, the writing you mentioned uh, just from the past week of uh, sort of in trying to indict much more in mass the Ukrainian population of Nazism or Nazi sympathies and these sorts of things. And it does seem, like you said, to give uh, try to give a permission structure to you know within the propaganda to uh, the you know the Putin regime to be able to continue to wage war and even potentially you know, war crimes and all of these things. So it's, it's a very, it's incredibly ugly, uh, ugly set of propaganda, uh, you know, since, uh, so, so definitely want to keep uh, on, on the lookout for that because that, you know, unfortunately may continue. Um, Keith uh, is uh, up next with a question. Keith, uh, if you're on audio or otherwise, please go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to mention the kind of like, uh, you kind of mentioned the propaganda side of it. Um, and how this got contextualized and like justified to Russian people in the same way um, a lot of these kinds of acts like it, it this doesn't seem to be very, like unique in in the sense of how they're justifying their own invasion like it feels like they they keep saying uh, there's neo Nazis in Ukraine it, it almost reminds me of how. Um, it kind of reminds me of like the Monroe Doctrine and or like a Manifest Destiny, um, justifying uh, expansion of your own borders um, because it's you know your your right to as a member of this nation or um, with the excuse of there's allegedly bad people in uh, this other region and like I I I wanted I didn't want to like give like a whole I'm sure I don't need to like explain a lot on that. It's, it, you already already know that kind of thing, but um, that that's just something that uh, I, I've been reminded of this whole time. Is is like this this does not feel unique. This seems like a very typical thing for like a, a nation to do if it's seeking to expand in in any way. Um, so let me, let me just say I agree with you on one level and disagree on another. So, so the level I agree with um, is the kind of <clears throat> familiarity, especially uh, of an empire uh, that was deprived of empire and wants to seize it back, right? In other mm -hmm. words, you have, uh, I mean, this, this reminds me more than anything else of Nazis. In other mm -hmm. words, you Hitler and, uh, you know, his goals for uh, recapturing that land or what he felt was recapturing the land that rightfully belonged uh, to the German Empire um, and that Germans were living, you know, beyond the borders of Germany and needed to be liberated. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, expanding the empire as a whole. And I think in the Putin case in Russia, it's very similar. In other words, he's... He, the Soviet Union, he said, was the greatest, you know, geopolitical catastrophe. The fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And then right after that, he said, tens of millions of Russians find themselves outside the borders of their homeland. Right. So a lot of what he's doing, um, you know, is based on this kind of um, uh, revanchism meaning getting back what he thinks or thought. Perceived is. loss. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is this aspect, and you're absolutely right, of imperial expansion, wherever it happens. You know, whether it's British in India or Americans in uh, South America or, um, uh, uh, you know, the French in Algeria or the Germans in Southwest Africa. 
Mm-hmm. Now, in all of those cases, you have imperial expansion, and and that expansion frequently leads, you know, to violence against the native peoples. So, um, you know, th- that is, you know, that's part of of um, uh, the history of empire. Um, and I was just reading something about the British Empire where. Uh, the new books about the British Empire are saying, okay, you know, let's get away from the idea um, that the British Empire somehow was a good thing because it brought the rule of law, you know, to places like India and, you know, wherever else there were, South Africa and Kenya and places like that. Because the process, in quotes, of bringing the rule of law meant the destruction of Native peoples and the peoples who lived there. And, and the bullying and the policing and the torturing and that sort of thing. Mm. So any empire, in other words, and in this case we're talking about the Russian Empire, you know, commits this kind of, of, of criminal uh, activity. It doesn't always commit genocide, but sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Southwest Africa, you know, uh, mm. today Namibia, German Southwest Africa, you know, that was the first genocide of the 20th century uh, with the Herero and Nama. Uh, you know, America, the United States, expanding westward, you know, committed genocide against uh, Native Americans, against indigenous peoples of the region. I mean, we have a f- great book, by the way. I mean, you guys are located somewhere else, but we have a wonderful book on uh, the genocide of the California Indians, uh, which came out a few years ago. And it's quite clear what happened, you know, that uh, tens of thousands of Indians were killed, you know, by the expanding American empire. Some, some sense. So, so yes. So, so that part of your story, um, I, th- I think, is right. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Keith, uh, for the engaging question there. Um, you had said earlier, Norman. Um, you talked about the um, maybe one of the uh, unique characteristics of uh, the current Russia-Ukraine situation, where. Uh, the, the the ideology that uh, Vladimir Putin has subscribed to and has talked about even publicly is this, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine, you know, to him, Ukraine is not a nation or the Ukrainians are not even necessarily a people, right, or even an ethnic group in some ways or a national group, however you want to define that, right? Uh, um, but I, you've, you've written eloquently and spoken eloquently before about uh, sort of the, uh, maybe it's the opposite sort of end of the spectrum historically with some genocides where um, a dictator or a uh, expansionist power creates a sort of group uh, for the purposes perhaps or the what becomes the result as a genocide. I, um, I remember I think one of the examples you had talked about uh, historically, uh, I mean you've written a lot about of course is the Soviet Union uh, under Stalin where the, uh, the kulaks as a social group, right? Um, were uh, the kulaks, and obviously Norman can talk about this, uh, were a, um, a set of, um, we shouldn't call them wealthy, but they were generally better off farmers than compared to the uh, sort of lowest class farmers of uh, the rural part of the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and, uh, and, and Stalin sort of gave characteristics uh, to the kulaks as, and, and in a way almost created this group. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to maybe talk about, I, when you were talking about the, the current situation uh, with, you know, Putin sort of saying, you know, the Ukrainians are, are not a group in a sense, are a part of Russia, maybe how that, con- how, how that contrasts or is unique compared to some of these other things that you've seen with, with genocide in other periods, uh, even in this case, you know, historically, the, what okay. was Russia, the Soviet Union. It's a good, interesting question. So, I mean, let's, let's start you know, uh, and you're an anthropologist, so you would start there too, with the, with the basic proposition that, or a sociologist too, right? You're a sociologist as well. So that more of a sociology proposition that a nation is something that's made, you know, it's created, it's in, it's in process. Um, and, and, and all nations are that way. I mean, they, they, you know, the notion that this is some kind of primeval um, entity, right, that there were Ukrainians. I mean, even now, uh, you know, you hear there were Ukrainians in the 10th century or Russians in the 10th century. That, that, that absolutely is not true. And, you know, over time, depending on the pace 
of historical development and modernization and industrialization, and also the history of nationalism in most of these countries. Nations are created. They're created. Um, and they're created, you know, mostly by intellectuals who decide for one reason or another, you know, that, that this group of people that share some characteristics here and there are a nation distinct from other nations and deserve, by the way, along with that, and that's nationalism, a place under the sun as an independent sovereign entity. So, you know, you, the extreme you know, of that is sort of to create a, 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 a nation in some fashion out of a social group. And that would be the Kulaks, right, in terms of destroying them. Um, this is a completely a social group, you know, a, a group of alleged rich farmers, uh, you know, but mostly anybody who opposed collectivization in the countryside was put in this group and then attacked, sometimes eliminated and sent off. Um, in the case of Ukrainians, it's, uh, it's complicated because the uh, story of Ukrainian-Russian entanglement uh, over the centuries is very, very complicated and deep, meaning that, um, you know, there are Russians who think of themselves as Ukrainians, Ukrainians who, think, who have thought of themselves as Russians. Um, Putin wrote this historical screed last July, which basically said there are three groups within the East Slav group, uh, Russians, that means great Russians, little Russians, meaning Ukrainians, and Belarusians or white Russians, uh, meaning the people uh, who are in Belarus, each of which has a kind of distinct language uh, and culture, but according to uh, uh, Putin, are all Russians, essentially. They're all Russians, essentially. And that essence of Russianness, you know, he calls uh, together the Russian world, or Ruski Mir. And this Russian world then has its own characteristics of, you know, a kind of broad Slavic uh, personality, you know, uh, a certain kind of attachment to the land, um, uh, you know, cultural orthodoxy. Uh, something called sobornost, which is the kind of sense of belonging together and all this kind of thing. And when Ukrainians say, no, no, <laughs> no, we, we, that's not us. You know, keep, your, keep this. I mean, we're Orthodox, but we don't like your Orthodoxy. And we believe in the land, but we don't want your land and that sort of thing. Putin says, is, is insulted in some ways and says, no. You know, we're going to make you into those Russians, uh, which 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 you uh, are essentially. And, and, and we know that's not true. Nobody's essentially anything. And the other part of the story is the Russians now in Ukraine. I may have mentioned this already. I can't remember. I, I, I did another one of these talks today, so I can't really remember what I've said and what I haven't said. But but the important thing about that, you know, Russians... In Ukraine, I mean, there's something like 20, 25 percent of the population are Russian, the Russian ethnicity. These Russians who are loyal to Ukraine, not all of them, by the way, which has made something of a problem uh, for Zelensky and the Ukrainian government. These Russians are beginning to say, you know, we're Ukrainians. We have nothing to do with Russia. And not only that, they're starting to give up their use of the Russian language altogether. In, in favor of U Ukrainian language. I mean, it's a kind of hybrid, you know, people live in a hybrid situation where some speak both Ukrainian and Russian, some speak a hybrid Ukrainian and Russian. Um, but interestingly, Russians in Ukraine are becoming Ukrainian, right? Uh, and the war has actually helped this process along very, very quickly. I mean, the war is an accelerator of a lot of things that were already happening. And this was already happening, but now even more so. You know, Russians are saying to themselves, these Russians, right? Look what they're doing to our country. And I don't want to be a Russian anymore. I mean, I mean, they're saying this sort of psychologically to themselves. I'm Ukrainian, you know, and enough of this. And I'm not going to speak Russian. I'm not going to worry about Russia anymore. Uh, no more of this hybrid situation. So in one way, it's a little sad because hybridity is always, I think, a very positive and creative force in society. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the nature of the game. So it's, it's in this notion of the kind of 
creation of nationality and creation of nations. I mean, the Ukrainian nation is still being created. Right now, let me, let me give you another example from the Russian side of things. I mean, Russia is not firm and fast in what it is and who it is. But some things are changing in Russia, too. And the way Russians are beginning to look at themselves is differing from the way they used to look at themselves. The kind of Europeanization of Russia, you know, which was part and parcel of what most people believed was a, a strong, excuse me, <coughs> you know, a strong uh, tendency in Russian society is being undermined by the war. Those people who are more European, who feel like they're the European, are leaving. You know, as far as we know, some in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million people have left already. And, <clears throat> and they're leaving because they have no home. And because this Russia is not them. But the Russia that's left is a different Russia. You know, one that's conforming more and more, you know, to Putin's idea of what Russia should be. I mean, let's hope that that process doesn't doesn't um, uh, become complete. And, you know, my hopes, I mean, I still have a lot of friends <clears throat> in Russia who hate this war and and who would just assume that, that Putin be gone and, uh, you know, are sad that the fact that democracy uh, and liberality, you know, are are gone, basically. Uh, in Russia. It's gone. It's all, you know, they don't even talk democracy anymore. They used to talk about a managed democracy. Now, now it's all gone. So, uh, you know, there's no freedom of the press. You can't get stuff on the internet. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't say this. You can't say that. You're locked up for this. You're locked up for that. So, you know, the, the country is, is becoming a different Russia. So just as Ukraine is evolving, so is Russia evolving. And in war, as we know, this kind of evolving uh, process speeds up. It's getting further dictatorial qualities, it seems, in Russia, right? It's, uh, you know, we have uh, further repression of speech. You know, we have uh, further, you know, all, all of these things uh, since since the war began and uh, under the Putin regime. To support what you said to Norman, and we've got a couple other questions here we'll get to uh, just after a couple points. It's, um, you know, uh, some of the higher quality surveys I believe we have of Ukraine uh, in the past few years have shown that, you know, a large portion of Ukrainians, even Russian ethnic Ukrainians, if you want to call them, uh, do support the independence of Ukraine, generally speaking. Um, you know, so so if you if you folks out here hear things about, you know, well, there is a quite a large portion of you know, Russian folks in Ukraine that support, uh, you know, Russian invasion you know, or, or, or don't support uh, Ukraine as an as a independent entity don't necessarily uh, be, be skeptical of that because uh, there there's you know a good amount of evidence that does show that uh, no, no, um, you know yeah that, that across even in the eastern regions uh, you, you yeah uh, no, well, there's large support for Ukrainian sovereignty you know. in 1991 when the Ukrainians voted for independence it was up for over 90 percent in every region uh, uh, including Crimea which is probably the most or was the most of the pro-russian regions uh, voted more than 50 percent for uh, independence. I mean, it is true that um, when Crimea was uh, absorbed, uh, you know, not 95 percent as the referendum showed at the time. I mean, that was fake. But certainly more than half of the people in, in Crimea were ready, you know, to go into Russia because Ukraine was having tough economic times and that sort of thing. But the rest, even Donetsk and Luhansk, you know, that you, you couldn't, you know, an honest referendum might well have turned out at the time um, before Ukrainians had to leave those regions uh, would have been probably voted for, for staying in Ukraine. Yeah, and, and um, I personally do have some, uh, the last decade or so, I've done some ethnographic work in both uh, in Russia mostly and a little in Ukraine. And it, like you said previously, it's not... Um, it's hard to overemphasize the connection, familial connections, uh, societal connections between the two countries. I mean, so many Ukrainians have, you know, Russian family, and so many Russians have intermarried with Ukrainians, and so on and so forth. They really are intertwined, uh, which makes this war, you know, also uh, an interesting and unique thing in that sense too. I think uh, uh, Courtney um, 
in the audience here had a question. Uh, sorry if I've got you, Courtney, early. If you're still uh, still there, you can go ahead and, and ask. Um, if you have uh, audio or video. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Courtney. Go ahead. Yeah, so my, my question is, um, how come society is so um, willing to discuss the current um, tragedies with um, Russia and Ukraine, but are not willing to discuss the ongoing tragedies with any other minority race? Well, I mean, I, obviously, I think that uh, we should discuss everything, right? I mean, all, every tragedy, every, you know, massacre, every uh, set of injustices, um, you know, should be part and parcel of who we are and uh, what we want out of the world. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person who has devoted my life, you know, 50 years of it now, uh, to teaching about Russia and Eastern Europe. So it's natural that this is what I do. This is my living. This is my world. I've spent day and night the last couple of weeks, you know, uh, thinking about the, the awfulness in Ukraine. And, um, you know, in terms of what's here, I mean, there are people who spend day and night thinking about, you know, America's issues with race problems, with police brutality, with, you know, unjustifiable, uh, you know, killing of innocent people in this country, of, you know, social and economic inequality. So, you know, I think there's I think there's room for both. And I think there's room for everything. And, and clearly, um, you know, you do what you can. You know, I do what I can within the context of what I know, you know, to speak about what's going on there. I, I can't speak with a lot of knowledge uh, about my own country. What I can do about my own country is clearly make a difference here at the university and in my department and with our students, and that kind of thing. Then I can, I can do my little bit, you know, to uh, promote racial equality and to deal with some of the uh, difficulties that have been in the past. So, you know, that, that's all I can say really about that, that, you know, you, you, you can do both and you should do both. And, you know, our, our senators and congressmen and, you know, should be thinking about and are, I hope, thinking about, you know, domestic issues, you know, the, the whole voting rights set of questions, which have become quite acute, you know, over the past month or so. I mean, that's a really big deal and it's really going to be huge for the next elections. And I hope they're and believe that they're, um, you know, they're they're going to fight that one out, um, and will accomplish something. But it's tough, you know. So that, that that's really all I can say. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, did uh, did Keith uh, and, and Norman? Do you mind? Uh, I know we uh, it sort of scheduled you for maybe an hour, hour and a half. Uh, do you do you need a time, or is that fine? Or put off okay. the. Again, I got confused about the timing, so I skipped. Oh no, something. no, that's okay. I just want—I just wanted to check. It's uh, just you know because we're we're you know getting a little later in time, so just always want to check. Uh, I think Keith had another question, then we can do another one after that. Keith, uh, did you have one again? Go ahead. Uh, I didn't necessarily have a question, but I just want to say something. I like I have observed is that um, it is it's been a very difficult for some people to um find themselves like a. In, to invest their time, their energy into learning more about uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine, when we know that in the backdrop um, there are still a lot of uh, very similar things happening uh, in the Middle East uh, with um, like uh, Yemen and Palestine, particularly, um, and those have uh, whereas normally they were not necessarily at the forefront of the news. They were kind of, um, you know, mentioned, mentioned here and there. They seem to have just completely fall out of the discussion. And um, I don't know how many, like, video clips anybody else here has seen, but uh, I did see a few clips floating around online of uh, European uh, news outlets um, when this was still coming to a boiling point in, I think, February, 
uh, or when it had just started to like actually become an invasion, uh, where a couple of European uh, newscasters said that this wasn't an uncivilized people going to war, which was a very weird thing to hear coming out of a news outlet. Um, because, you know, like, bringing context to that, if, if they're saying, well, this is a, a civilized people going to war, what's a not civilized people going to war? And I feel like knowing, what, knowing that, it, it seems like they're directly calling the Middle East, uh, or not directly, indirectly calling the Middle East uh, uncivilized, which was just a very hard thing to, to, to watch. Because I think e they they do matter equally as conflicts. So I, I just yeah, think, think it's okay. I mean, yeah, uh, Norman. I mean, and, and sort of maybe extend Keith's question here. I mean, uh, you know, we could even look at the example of Rwanda, for example, in the you know uh, you know back in the '90s versus say uh, you know uh, coverage of that versus uh, Yugoslavia or Serbia and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the, the I mean, Keith's you know bringing up points here about the um, you know how how we how we think about these things, how we talk about these things in terms of different regions of the world, different peoples, and you know classifying them as such. I suppose. So, uh, just a couple of things that I was thinking about as you were talking, Keith. Uh, um, and this relates a little bit to the previous question too. Was it Colette? Was her name? I, I think who who asked the question? Uh, Courtney. Courtney. What what? What was Courtney her name? Was the previous? Courtney. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, so isn't it interesting, just on, the, on an abstract level, um, how the news media has just a hell of a lot of trouble concentrating on more than one thing at a time, right? I mean, there was a while, you know, when um, uh, you know issues of race, for example, were on the front pages every day, and not only that, you know, pages and pages of stuff about. Um, you know, uh, the unjustifiable killings of um, uh, black men and women by uh, the police and police brutality and then police funding and all those kinds of issues. You know, there were, the newspapers were filled with them. And then now uh, we have the Russian-Ukraine war. And they just didn't you know the, the papers and, I mean, CNN, I mean, if you watch CNN, it's about the war in Ukraine. Right? Well, for somebody like me who's desperate for news from Ukraine and trying to see what's going on, that's good. But for 95% of the population, you know, I mean, they're interested, but they're not ready to, you know, devote all that time. So it's, our, our media is really a problem, I think, in the sense that they get these kind of, um, you know, they, they, they invest in certain kinds of issues. Um, and uh, sometimes justifiably, and you know, Given, given what's happened in Ukraine, it's, it's justifiable. Given what's happened in our, you know, in our cities uh, uh, last year, it was justifiable. Um, but then that's all they know, and that's all they're willing to talk about. And the Middle East, I think, is one of those things where people are weary, and the news media is weary, of trying to explain what's going on. Um, and it's also very hard to explain what's going on. In other words, you know, the question of the involvement of the Saudis and Iran and all that kind of thing is really very, very difficult. And sorry, my light goes off. I have to wave it back on again. Um, it's very difficult, you know, to, to come to terms with and day after day, you know, to uh, deal with in a, in a sane uh, fashion. You know, there's certainly always, and this is your the implication of your question and uh, of what was brought up about Rwanda, there's always a little bit of this issue of race involved as well, which is to say, you know, the the war in Ukraine is mostly about, in quotes, white folks or civilized folks, as you put it. Whereas, uh, and in Bosnia, it was Europeans, right, versus um, Africans. And so, you know, we didn't pay much attention to Rwanda, you know, for, for too long. But I mean, we didn't pay much attention to Bosnia either for too long. Um, but there's always this issue, too, of, of you know, who the news media is identifying with. In the case of Ukraine, it's interesting, again, you know, uh, I mean, I'm somebody who wants as much as I can get. 
you know, about Ukraine and Russia. Um, it's interesting also that this is one of these good guys versus bad guys fights. You know, it's one of the reasons it was so, you know, people for a long time, you know, when dealing with the question of genocide, could talk about nothing else but the Holocaust. I mean, the, the deal with the Holocaust was, you know, and still is, you know, you have these awful Nazi perpetrators and these essentially innocent Jews who had no, you know, were kind of left, you know, to these brutal killers. And, um, you know, the, mor the morality play of it, you know, was absolutely clear. Uh, and there was no, you know, no doubting of, of, of again, the, the, there's no complexity there, right? And it's similar with Russia and Ukraine. You know, it's, it's bad guys invading innocent people who are trying, you know, trying desperately to build a young democracy. And um, uh, so that morality play also appeals then to news media to commentators and to that kind of thing. It appeals to us as scholars and teachers. You know, it's easy to teach a morality play. It's harder to teach, you know, complexity and difficulty and, uh, you know, the, the playing out of, of more complex societal forces than it is to sort of say, okay, you're bad guys clobbering good guys. Um, this is your basic story. So I, I mean, I know I know what you mean, uh, Keith, by this a story like the Yemen story, you know, and the Houthi, and you know, well, you know the Iranians and the Saudis and the Israelis and all this kind of stuff, you know, all all mixed into a a, 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 a nasty pot um, is hard to unscramble. And so I think. In some cases, the news media, I mean, there are no clear good guys and bad guys, at least not that I can see. And, um, uh, uh, you know, that makes it harder to deal with. And sometimes maybe, too, there's a, a bit of historical familiarity, too. We have, you know, the historical familiarity generally in the U.S. population with Russia during the Cold War. And, you know, it's... Uh, uh, compare that to say Rwanda, where you know the U.S. doesn't, the U.S. population doesn't really directly, very generally, broadly speaking, of course, have uh, a lot of you know knowledge or familiarity. It should, but it doesn't, and you know, and so so perhaps that that plays a a role in this as well. That would also speak to the to the the Yugoslavia and the Balkans. Uh, the U.S. you know we we didn't necessarily have a lot of uh, relative, of course, to say Russia. You know, historical yeah. familiarity too. So. That's absolutely right. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Tawana had a question here. Uh, Tawana, uh, hope I pronounced the name correctly. Uh, go ahead. Yes, you did. I don't know how to get the video going. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my question is: Is America always at um always trying to help the other countries? with these wars because they get a lot of their resources from the other countries or have they signed something saying well america is stronger and we're willing to help you why is it that we assist when they're in war like that well, i mean it's a it's a good question uh Tawana, and people have said for example that one of the reasons actually that putin wants ukraine is oil resources or petroleum resources in the eastern part of uh, ukraine around the donetsk uh, base, and I don't think there's much there to tell you the truth. And we're certainly not there because of Ukrainian resources, although the world as a whole is now suffering, as you may know, from the fact that, uh, you know, Ukrainian grain uh, plus Russian grain made up about, you know, I don't know 40% of the world's uh, grain production. And so that, you know, that grain production is now gone, basically. And so, you know, there's hunger. Uh, in in places uh, that depended, you know, North Africa especially, uh, South Asia, there's hunger in places where grain was sold by, uh, especially Ukrainian grain, which was a big chunk of all of that. No, I don't, I don't think we're there for resources, and each place is a little bit different. I mean, it's clear that the Middle East involvement, you know, in, in Iraq especially, also in Syria, had a lot to do you know, with petroleum resources and with trying to um, stabilize uh, the high, those resources. I see you now. Uh, and um, uh, that was clearly part of it. No, I think, I think the um, Ukrainian involvement, you know, has a lot to do 
with American ideology, meaning a sense that we need to support, you know, in especially in a time when there seem to be more and more autocrats around, you know, including uh, in China and in um, uh, Russia, that we need to support democracy. Then there was also, you know, the threat to our own democracy, which is still there, right, from Trump in January 6th and what happened there and how that then plays into our kind of psychology of wanting to promote democracy uh, abroad. I think that's a genuine kind of ideological predisposition of our foreign policy. In other words, we do this because, you know, we believe that this system is right for us, and not only that, right for everyone else, and in addition to that, that, that it supports each other. In other words, that a worldwide system of democracies uh, is better for us and better for our economy and better for our people and polity than one where there are autocracies. And again, you know, the Trump flirtation with autocracy was, you know, was was scary. I mean, it was scary to me um, what happened on January 6th. And, and, you know, we don't want that to happen again. So there's this kind of sense that we're, in quotes, fighting for democracy. Well, we're helping a de democracy carry out its own fight because we're not fighting, you know, troops. I mean, boots are not on the on the ground. I mean, we're giving them a lot of money and we're also supporting them with weapons. But we're actually not doing any fighting. Uh, some people think we should. Um, so that's part of it. Part of it is also the security structure of the world. And how, you know, this whole issue of sec our security tied into European security. You know, NATO and the centrality of NATO. Uh, you know, it's one of the alliances that has worked, you know, since it was formed in 1948. 49? 49, 49, I think. Okay, either 48 or 49, don't quote me. Uh, one of those two. And um, right after the Berlin blockade, so it would have been 49. Um, so um, it was, uh, you know, NATO has become a central focus of how we think uh, and the Atlantic Alliance about how we think about our national security. You know, so the people in the Pentagon, I remember in the Pentagon, they Ten, not, maybe not tens of thousands. Yeah, they may be tens of thousands of people. You know, if you add up this whole establishment in Washington that worries about your security and mine, right? This is what they spend their days and nights worried about. And when they worry about it, you know, something like Ukraine is extremely important because if Putin would take it over, there would be a direct threat to doing the next step, which would be a NATO country. So better to stop him in Ukraine and, you know, somewhat cynically using Ukrainian blood to do it. I mean, it's not our blood, right? I mean, it's our resources, but not our blood. Um, you know, with Ukrainian blood to do it is the right thing to do now. So I guess that's how I would deal with that question. It's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tawana. Uh, Justin had a question here, and this is, you know, on the chat message board. Um, I don't know if anything's gonna get the Putin regime out of power, and uh, this is actually maybe a question uh, even better suited uh, for Leon Aaron in a couple of weeks, who's uh, 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 up on Russian politics today, but um, we're gonna ask you too, Norman, uh, maybe maybe about the legal legal um, legalese of war crimes internationally here. Um, you know, uh, Putin and the regime have been accused of war crimes at this point, sort of informally. Um, what is, is there any future of potentially charging him or members of the Russian government or the regime with war crimes? This is a standing regime. How does something like that work? Is that something that you could, could address or maybe speak to a little bit at least about the, the future of the Putin regime, given that, you know, the, the, at least the war crimes accusation and if there, that were to become or could have become a more formal um, no. legal the, sort of uh, international uh, thing? Accusation of war crimes is important. Uh, it's important to collect documentation, as people are. I can't even, again, I can't remember what I've told you yet or not. But this morning I was on another uh, call from Ukraine with a bunch of human rights people who are talking about uh, documenting all, all the crimes that are going on. I did tell you about this, that there were 650 or something like that, war crimes that they've documented. They're collecting material, they're sending it. And by the way, the, the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court was there 
you know, in Bucha, collecting stuff himself. Uh, U.S. government is collecting stuff. NGOs are collecting stuff. I mean, there's a huge effort to try to document the war crimes and crimes against humanity that are going on uh, and will continue to go on. I mean, it's a little scary what's coming, by the way. I mean, we should be worried about what's coming um, because the Russians are not finished by a long shot. Um, Anyway, you know, there's a huge effort to document these crimes. And one fine day, uh, Putin may or may not come to court, but he will be indicted. Right? He'll be indicted. And whether we can get him or not is just a question of whether uh, the Russians overthrow him or not. Now, to go to that question, I think the war crimes accusation, as I say, it's important. It needs to be done. Uh, it's um, a part of what the international justice system has become, and it, and what it's become is also important. It's a real change uh, in the way we think about human rights, um, uh, but its effect will be minimal, absolutely minimal, certainly on Russia and certainly on Putin. Um, there, there's a minimal effect. Um, you know, there are different ways that Putin might be overthrown. And I say might because I think the chances are very, very slim. You know, one of the ways is through demonstrations on the street, but that's clear that that's getting nowhere. And not only that, excuse the expression, but the, you know, the police are just beating the shit out of the demonstrators. I've not seen this kind of violence from the police. And, you know, I used to demonstrate with Russians myself. And, you know, there, there wasn't ever this kind of violence. Um, uh, that you see in, in the pictures. They're just really beating the hell out of them and locking them up, you know. So it's a really unpromising path. Another path that people have mentioned are the sort of oligarchs, you know, the big rich guys. And that they may, you know, they're being uh, sanctioned and they're being um, uh, singled out and they don't like that. You know, their kids can't go to schools in the West or go skiing, you know, to Switzerland and that sort of thing. So they're clearly unhappy, but they are essentially puppets of Putin by this point. I mean, he's cleared out any oligarchs who had any independence whatsoever. <clears throat> and the ones who are left may complain to themselves or to their wives on the pillow at night, but that's it. I mean, they will not, uh, they will not have a chance. There's the military. People have talked about a potential military coup. Uh, of generals. We do know there were some generals who opposed the war um, and their generals have been removed and KGB people, by the way, uh, you may have seen, uh, have been removed. My hunch is it had something to do with them saying this is a bad war, uh, but we don't really know why they were removed. People say it's because the war went bad, but I think it's it may indicate some opposition uh, to the war. May not. I mean, it may not. But I think it's unlikely. I mean, both organizations, both, you know, the FSB, as it's now called, the form that used to be the KGB, and uh, the Russian military have a strong, long tradition of complete obeisance, you know, to secular power, uh, Soviet period and now. So I don't think that's a possibility. The only possibility might be among the political elite in the Kremlin. And there, you know, clearly there are going to be people who um, very quietly oppose the war, you know, and they're not going to say anything. But a couple of things might happen. And I'm just going to mention this. I mean, we don't know. You know, historians are uh, notoriously bad predictors, and we're really good about talking why things happen. But, you know, predicting things, you know, we can't do very well, and we don't really believe in it. But a couple of things might happen. Um, you know, one, the Ukrainians might win. You know, they might win. We don't know that yet. But if they won the war, you know, Putin would be in such bad odor that I think, you know, even though he would find ways to claim that he won it, um, uh, I think there's a possibility that a political elite might sort of find a way to get rid of him. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if negotiations began and, you know, words started getting out about what happened in Ukraine, 
you know, and then negotiations, you know, require a certain public face. And it's possible more people would learn, you know, in quotes, the truth, uh, which is that the Russians have pummeled, you know, their cousins. Yeah, I mean, even if you consider them Russians, they're their cousin Russians, you know, and that they have pummeled them and killed them and tortured them, raped them uh, and destroyed their homes, you know, in unforgiving ways. I mean, just absolutely unforgiving ways. By the way, I should have admitted at the beginning, I never predicted this war. Now, on February 24th, I was shocked. I was totally shocked. Um, I just didn't think they would do it. Um, now you can kind of say, well, this is why they did it. That's why they did it. But I never. So those are the four possibilities. I think the political elite is maybe the strongest possibility uh, of doing something, you know, that um, might, you know, remove Putin from power. But not war. I mean, the war crimes thing is, I, I, I don't want to call it extraneous, you know, to the outcome, but it's marginal. I mean, let's let's get it straight. It's a marginal piece of this story. It's an important part, but it's marginal. It's an excellent question, but it is a tough problem to solve. The, the Putin regime is a military police gangster regime in many ways, and it's insular, and it's, you know, it's it's hard enough just to even understand what is going on. Putin has accum had 22 plus years to accumulate so much power, you know, and it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a tough one to solve. But, you know, Perhaps at least the the uh, at some point a, for, a formal war crimes documentation the the Ukrainians are doing uh, at least well at, at documenting it. Uh, it sounds like especially from your conversation that, that you've had with them, I know how much you're integrated with the uh, uh, Ukrainian folks and have these discussions with them. So that is, at least that is happening, and uh, perhaps there will be a formal uh, um, uh, accusation, you know, legal accusation at some point, but. Um, um, but but it is a tough one to try to get the Putin regime out, of course, as it is with many dictatorships. Um, uh, I, well, this this may be a good transition uh, and, and a good uh, stopping point at this point. Uh, we're at time, I know, for our audience and for our advertised time. Uh, this is uh, it does act as a good transition uh, from what we've talked about uh, previously, and will, we will talk about even further in our next session on April 28th. Um, Norman, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this has been a wonderful. Uh, conversation really uh, gets us, especially with the number of anthropology and sociology and social science uh, students we have in our session here. Uh, I know uh, at least some of the uh, audience here uh, this afternoon and this evening, getting us to think about uh, how groups are formed. Uh, you know, both uh, in, in in the propaganda sense of you know, uh, uh, and uh, and 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 how this operates in war and genocide and uh, the. The, the creation and the effects of groups and group thinking on these things. Uh, it, it really is uh, quite a dynamic uh, um, uh, so, social um, uh, social phenomena. And uh, as you've uh, talked about before, the crime of crimes in some ways, when we talk about crimes against humanity, is an incredibly important thing. Uh, genocide to uh, to think about uh, is one of the, unfortunately one of the worst things that humans. Uh, can do to other humans in mass. And so uh, we thank you very much, Norman, for being here. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the time too. It was a pleasure. Um, it was great to, uh, to have the questions and, uh, and thank you again uh, for this. And, and hopefully our students take a lot of uh, lessons from this about how to uh, think about genocide and war, uh, about the current situation in Russia, Ukraine, and, uh, and to be able to make some positive uh, contributions to this discussion and just to the world about these things going forward. So. Uh, so thank you, uh, Norman, again for for joining us uh, today. You're welcome, and thank you for thank you for the good questions, and uh, you know enjoy your series. This looks like a good one. So, all right, Norman, uh, and thank you uh, to our audience here for being here this evening, and thank you for joining us on the Global Studies Lecture Series. We will see you all next time. Take care, everybody.